we are ready to start our session on innovations in local street maintenance program management. Uh, we have three speakers today, all from Professional Engineering Consultants, PEC. Kristen Zimmerman is the team lead for PEC's planning GIS and land development team. Sheldon Bina is the GIS manager at Professional Engineering Consultants, and Luke Peter is responsible for the sign of roadways, grading, utilities, stormwater, and erosion control plans. In this session, um, they will review innovations in street maintenance program management, from the new GIS-based technologies that easily and affordably collect and map street condition inventories, to proactive maintenance program planning, to new surface treatment models, methods, these innovations can be applied by local governments to modernize operations, support database decision making, and save money over the life of the individual asset. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues at PEC. Thanks. Well, thank you, Lisa. We appreciate the introduction and appreciate the opportunity to uh, be a part of this exciting summit. So um, good morning. Good to see everyone. Looks like we've got a great group of folks here. Uh, here with PEC, we do uh, partner with our clients to energize communities and shape the future. And as the on-call engineer for several cities in Kansas, we have had the opportunity to work with many public works departments, uh, leadership and staff on local street maintenance best practices uh, from design uh, of new streets all the way to maintenance and preservation of existing streets. And today we're going to be focused on a proactive management approach that does make the best use of these limited life cycle dollars uh, that local governments have to use for street maintenance. So we, we know that uh, the local street system is one of the largest assets held by local governments. As you can see on the screen here, millions of dollars are spent constructing and maintaining them. Uh, this this uh, specific table is, is a table of the dollars that have been spent just in the Wichita metro area, just on the regional transportation system. So these are the major arterials and the highways in our region and the public transit system. So you can see the uh, impact from local governments. Uh, they're contributing 45% of the total funding to this regional system plus the entirety of all of their local streets. So we know that, that local governments play, play a big role here, have spent a lot of money on their local streets and want to take care of that investment. Uh, next slide, please. And if you are familiar with local governments, uh, we all know how much citizens do care about their streets. Uh, we know that our citizens care about the condition, the parking, uh, the capacity, and the speed of drivers going down the, the street. And if you are familiar with local government, you might hear how much they care about uh, these issues as, as quoted quite eloquently by Leslie Nope from the Parks and Rec uh, TV show you might be familiar with. So uh, it only makes sense. It is their tax dollars at work that are being used to pay for these streets. And so there is a lot of concern there. So uh, given the importance of the streets, the local street system, today's session will be reviewing innovations in local street um, maintenance program management. Sheldon Bina is here, our GIS manager, and he's gonna talk some about the, these new GIS-based technologies that can be used easily and affordably to collect and map street condition data and keep track of and manage uh, this data over the long term. And then Luke is going to finish up our presentation talking about this proactive management approach to manage streets on a life cycle basis. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sheldon to talk about some of these GIS tools. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Um, so it all kind of started with us was how, how can we be more efficient, um, you know, and previously using paper workflows um, where it's prone to error. Um, and then if you have to re-enter it into an Excel spreadsheet, um, that all takes extra time that is unnecessary. So, and then also, well, we did have it um, just using Excel, but again, there's still limitations um, with that method. So 
um, through discussions and, and thinking what would be the best workflow we came up with, um, let's go ahead and incorporate these payment evaluations into GIS. And beginning with um, the data collection, um, we start with, a, with an app um, and th these apps can work online as well as offline um, and preferably on an uh, Apple or Android platform. Um, so we start with, with the, the map that is, uh, or I'm sorry, that is map based. Um, and then the evaluator can then go to the street segment that they are standing on, select that segment, and then it will then populate some um, information automatically into the form that you see here on the left, such as the segment ID and the segment name. And the segment ID is very critical um, to always keep the same so that we can always relate it back to the actual segment. And then on this form that you see here, um, it has intelligence. So if I would select by pavement type, um, if I would select asphalt, it would then bring up the criteria specifically for an asphalt segment. Um, and it also has, you can set up fields to be required or not. Um, and it just helps to um, lower the, the possibility of having introducing errors into your data collection, as well as there's a lot of uh, pick lists. So you're not having to enter, enter in the data. So it's always being consistently entered. And then um, once the data is entered, then it will automatically populate into um, to this dashboard that you see on the right. And with this dashboard, um, the one here has the different metrics of PESA rating, functional classification, um, um, pavement material type. And it will also allow you to go in and select each segment and it will give you the information in a pop-up per how that segment was rated. Um, another really nice benefit of doing it, this method is being able to take pictures and you can see the pop-up on the, towards the left of the screen where, it, um, which is a, a picture that was taking on that particular segment and that further um, validates how you were evaluating the, the street at that time. And, and this um, dashboard is totally customizable to fit different audiences. So it can be for the street supervisor and showing different kind of information to the council or even to the public. Um, and also, um, Going a little bit a step further, we are currently looking into artificial intelligence on how we can better improve our, our data collection. Um, we are currently in a pilot project with that, and um, that is something that we are very looking forward to on, on seeing the results from, from that method. And with that, I will pass it on to Luke. All right, so I'm going to talk about a project we're currently working on in Bel Air, Kansas. Uh, this is just outside of Wichita. Um, what you're seeing here is kind of our data collection effort that Sheldon was talking about. Um, basically, I went out and walked every street using that app, um, you know, categorizing the distresses I saw, and then giving it an overall rating based on the PACER rating scale. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about the PACER rating. Um, basically, it just kind of gives you guidelines on rating streets from 1 to 10, and then those ratings kind of um, relate to what treatments are recommended. Um, so you can see there's a couple of neighborhoods that were built in the 60s and 70s there in the red um, that haven't got a lot of love out in Bel Air. Um, and then having this kind of dashboard showing all the different ratings for the entire uh, city really helps um, city staff as well as the public to kind of get a picture of how the community looks um, from a pavement condition standpoint, and then plan out, um, you know, improvements, um, which I'll kind of touch on here. So like I said, these ratings kind of relate to the um, treatment 
that is needed. So obviously rating one or two is gonna need reconstruction. It's kind of failed pavement. You see a lot of potholes. And we'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, rating three or four is a little step above, uh, but would require some rehabilitation, um, milling and overlaying, um, some patching. Uh, and then five, six, seven is more kind of your preservation treatments. Uh, those are your surface seals, crack sealing, um, and that kind of bleeds into the routine maintenance, which is crack sealing and pothole uh, filling as it comes up. Um, and then rating eight, nine, or 10, fairly new pavement, um, just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, and obviously it's gonna kind of deteriorate as time goes on there. So you can see kind of a long list of different treatment types, obviously for preservation, there's a lot of different um, applications that can be applied. They're all kind of the same, um, or at least fit into two bins. That's the surface seal or crack sealing. Basically surface sealing is kind of applying a thin layer of asphalt emulsion with some aggregate the goal is just to kind of seal all the cracks in the roadway. Um, and then crack sealing is just kind of individually um, sealing transverse cracks. Um, and then there's also crack fill filling for wider cracks um, and other treatments like thermal crack repair out there. They all kind of accomplish the same thing, which is sealing cracks so that water doesn't get into them um, and start to deteriorate that pavement. Then rehabilitation, Obviously we're looking at rating three or four that would require some sort of structural improvement to the pavement. We're looking at an overlay or mill and overlay um, as well as some patching. Um, and then reconstruction, there's really only one thing you can do is reconstruct the pavement there. Um, so there's a wide range of different treatments out there. Um, we won't go into too much detail about those, um, but just kind of stating that there are many treatments to choose from. So again, going back to Bel Air as an example, uh, kind of breaking it out into those rating bins, there's only about eight segments that needed that reconstruction in Bel Air. Um, and what those look like, you'd see severe distortions, um, specifically against the curb line where it holds water, that water gets down into the pavement, into the subgrade, and causes those depressions or upheaving of the pavement. Obviously you're gonna see a lot of potholes in these rated streets and that's caused by this alligator cracking that eventually kind of pops off and creates those pothole areas. So then rating three or four, like I said, those two neighborhoods that were built in the 60s and 70s are kind of ready for some structural improvement to their, their streets. Um, and we'll kind of show you uh, what our plan is. Um, so right now we're kind of currently developing a 10 year maintenance plan so that they can kind of implement it and get everything up to that kind of maintainable proactive approach, which we'll touch on a little later here. So what those three and four rated streets look like, you see a lot of edge cracking. They've attempted to do some patching, um, but it's starting to fall into the fair to poor um, rated patching areas. And then you see extensive block cracking as well. And finally, the uh, five and six rated streets kind of spread out. Um, these were built in the 90s, 2000s. They've seen some treatments, but they're kind of fall, starting to fall into um, needing some sort of treatment um, to kind of bring them up uh, so that they don't fall into that rehab reconstruction zone. That's really kind of the goal is to keep things in this preservation zone for as long as possible, because once you drop down into that rehab reconstruction, things get uh, pretty expensive. Um, so what those five and six rated streets look like, again, a lot of them have been treated with some sort of surface seal, but those cracks are trying to, starting to seep through those surface seal areas um, and it's starting to show signs of distress and needing another treatment um, to the roadway. So this is kind of the approach that we're advocating for. Um, is a proactive approach to pavement management. Um, a lot of these smaller towns have a more reactionary approach, um, which is, you know, you put it in a new road, don't touch it until it starts to cause problems and fall into disarray. And then you're looking at a more expensive uh, improvement to the road. Um, and just in general, we as humans <laughs> generally have a reactionary approach to a lot of things, um, but obviously having a more proactive staying on top of it, doing treatments while it's still in that good to fair range will extend the life of the pavement and 
obviously save the city money um, and impact the communities less by construction. Um, you know, a lot of these pres preservation treatments can be done in a day um, and don't impact the neighborhood as much of a, as a mill and overlay or reconstruction will. Um, so you, that chart kind of uh, illustrates the goal there in the blue is to, you know, hit those treatments early and often um, to seal those cracks um, and extend the life of the pavement. Now, eventually you'll obviously need to mill and overlay or do some sort of reconstruction. You know, you can't keep putting band-aids on it forever, but at least extending the life of the pavement and kind of categorizing everything helps you plan it out better for when those reconstruction and mill and overlay projects need to come. Um, Cause eventually they'll need to happen. But right now in Bel Air, you know, we're kind of playing catch up cause there is so much of that that is needed. Um, so again, some other points for an effective pavement preservation strategy. Like I said, you wanna hit good pavement ahead of distresses, not just hitting the worst streets first, um, but extending the life of those kind of average rated streets. Um, and applied at the right time, um, pavement is restor restored in new condition if you do preservation right. Um, and obviously the cumulative effect of treatments postpones that rehab, um, that costly rehab or reconstruction. Um, so like I said, it's less expensive over the long term and less disruptive to traffic as well. Um, and just for comparison's sake, um, you know, a preservation treatment um, compared to a rehab or reconstruction, a rehab is going to run you four to five X what a preservation treatment is going to cost and a reconstruction is about 10 to 12 X the cost. Um, so you can kind of see you can build up multiple of those preservation surface seal type treatments um, for the cost of what is an intrusive um, rehab or reconstruction um, type treatment. So going back to Bel Air again, First, we kind of divided everything up into neighborhoods that kind of match the pavement condition. Um, you know, it kind of matches when these uh, neighborhoods were put in is how the pavement condition looks today. Um, so our goal with this is try to get everything up to that green or yellow range um, or good to fair pavement condition so that it can kind of easily be put in that cycle of preservation. Um, so we have a little bit of catch up to do to get those streets that are in that poor to very poor range um, up to that preservation zone there. Um, also to note, Bel Air is in the recent years um, put in a strategy of favoring concrete streets over asphalt. So you can see a lot of the concrete development to the Northeast here um, is recent developments that they've put in with concrete. Um, Obviously, concrete is more expensive initially, um, but it costs less over time maintenance wise. So that's why they're kind of favor, favoring concrete streets um, for their newer developments. Um, so just something to note there. Um, so we'll come back to this when we um, update it in five years. So our goal is to kind of give them a five year strategy of what areas to hit with what treatments. Um, in order to get everything up to that good to fair um, pavement condition. So I'm gonna be showing you the first five years that we've planned out. Again, this first five years, we're kind of playing catch up. Um, they have a little extra funds in this first year um, to do so. So you can kind of see in those worst neighborhoods, we were proposed doing some full depth patching, um, but not forgetting again, the streets that could fall into that rehab rating, still doing some surface seals um, in those neighborhoods. Um, again, we don't want to just do worst first, because um, if you forget about those streets rated five to six, they could easily fall into that rehab category. Um, so you kind of see what we're hitting in that first year. Then the second year, we're coming back and milling overlaying those um, worst rated neighborhoods, um, also doing some microsurfacing, which is a form of surface sealing to some arterial streets as well. And you can kind of see our budget number kind of goes down as we go. This year three, we're hitting the last of those um, worst rated streets there. Um, and then by year four, we're getting back into kind of a normal um, preservation treatments um, to various neighborhoods doing surface seals 
to a couple neighborhoods, uh, as well as some of the arterial streets around Bel Air. Um, and then year five, again, same thing, doing more surface seals of that preservation treatment type. Um, and as the years go on, we do give them additional funds um, just because, you know, we can't really predict the future. You know, the first five years, we have kind of a good handle on how the pavement will deteriorate. But beyond that, um, the city plans to do evaluations, you know, every three to five years so that they can have a better picture um, of what streets need to be hit next. So we want to give them some flexibility with this, not just be so rigid that they do this exact um, maintenance plan um, because, you know, nobody can predict the future. Nobody knows the price of asphalt that keeps going up. Um, there's many variables that go into um, how the streets will deteriorate and, you know, the city's budget. Um, so giving them that flexibility and the tools to make those decisions is really important. Um, you know, I went out there and walked the streets with city staff, um, showing them the app, giving them the tools so that they can do this, um, and obviously reference us if needed. Um, but I mean, this stuff is, you know, fairly simple, but it's a little overwhelming on where to start. So we're giving them um, that good start um, to jump off of. So you can see here, uh, this is kind of the progress after the five years, if they stick to this plan, um, kind of the ratings of the streets uh, that we would predict getting everything or most everything into that good to fair pavement condition range. Um, and then obviously, you know, in that five years, we would suspect some of the streets that were in that good condition kind of fall into the more fair to good range. Um, and that's, that's totally fine. That just means it's ready for some sort of preservation treatment. Um, so you can see here, it's flip-flopping between 2022 and what we would expect in 2027 if they stick to the plan. So you can kind of see all those worst rated streets get up to that good range. Um, and some of the good streets fall into more um, fair pavement condition. Um, but it makes it a lot easier from here to kind of sort out what the next steps are um, because everything's kind of jump started and back to a neutral level that then we can um, put that proactive strategy to work. Um, so that's kind of our first five years. We're still developing years six through 10. Um, we're actually meeting with Bel Air City Council tonight to kind of go over this plan with them. Um, but that's just kind of an introduction and in how we're tackling um, this pavement evaluation and maintenance planning for this local municipality. Um, so with that, I'll, we'll pause for any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Luke, Kristen, and Sheldon. I know that there was a question that was posted in the chat that Kristen responded to already, but while other folks are posting their questions, uh, the question Seth posted was, how does PASOR rating relate to PCI rating? Uh, um, and Kristen, you answered it in the chat, um, but do you want to give a little information to the group? You are muted. Let's see if we can unmute. Thank, oh, thank you, go. Lisa. I got it. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. So the PCI rating, um, that's a, a different pavement um, methodology, pavement condition assessment methodology that stands for pavement condition index. It is on a one to 100 scale where the PASER rating is on a one to 10 scale. In general, we found the PCI to be um, a little bit more involved, I think, than, than probably we felt like would be a good fit for um, some of our clients to be able to do on a recurring basis that was um, an affordable way and something that um, they could stick with on an ongoing basis. So that's what I tried to kind of lay out there in terms of why we, um, why, why we chose the PASER rating over the, the PCI. Luke, I don't know if you want to add, add any more to that. Uh, no, you did a great job of explaining. Um, I mean, they both pretty much do the same thing. It's just setting a rating to your street so that then you can evaluate and plan accordingly. Um, and it kind of splits up by region. It seems like a lot of the Midwest uses the PACER rating and maybe the PCI is specific to another area. But everything I've seen around here, um, most people use the PACER rating. And it's just simpler, you know, one through 10, one through 100. 
just make it one through 10, it's easier and makes it uh, easier for stakeholders and city staff to understand it, so. Yeah, most of our clients we're working with, you know, this is just one small aspect of their job. And, um, you know, it's a big, it's a big step forward to get something like this implemented in terms of these GIS tools and the dashboard and this process to kind of go about how this proactive approach. So, uh, yeah, we definitely leaned on the, the side of, of something more simpler. And then I also noted that it does include a methodology for assessing gravel streets, which the PCI doesn't. And some, some of our cities do have gravel streets we needed to account for. Thank you. That's really important. Um, yeah, we have a lot of gravel roads still in a lot of areas in Kansas and their yep. condition is ever evolving a lot more quickly than the pavement side. Um, so I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, if you have additional questions for this team, post them in our live feed. This is located in the link is located in the chat for the in Zoom. Otherwise, thank you so much, colleagues from PEC, for presenting this information. It's really helpful, and we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I did want to let the group know that we will be in your uh, Midwest Mobility webinar series on the 19th, where we'll dive into a little bit more on some of these GIS tools and that artificial intelligence Sheldon mentioned. Awesome. Thank you. That's true. We'll see you next week. Thank you all. See you at the next section. Thank you. Take care. Yep.